Before we start, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. And um, I do want to say thank you um, for the opportunity to speak. But let's take a moment and confess any sin if necessary. Uh, confession of sin is necessary so that God, the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the Word of God, can teach us His Word. So mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, and overt sins are an exercise that we do so that we begin to be in fellowship and God can teach us. This is not only true for those that have come here through the automobile, but also for those over the internet. So just take a moment, confess any sin privately, and we'll begin. Well, Father, I do thank you for this day. I do lift up to you, Father, um, Ron and Al, and all those who are traveling uh, back from Rome, Georgia. I uh, pray for traveling mercies for them. I pray for the Swan family specifically and all of those around them. Just surround them with people, Father, that can um, encourage their hearts. They, this is a celebration, and uh, we just want to celebrate this passing and encourage them to continue to, to move forward day by day with your blessing. Uh, and also, Father, I would like to pray for these that are, have been brutally murdered in Texas. I ask, Father, that uh, of all places in church, but I do thank you. Uh, your, your word tells us that all things work together for good, and so I pray for that good to be shown visibly through those who understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and that they can be there to comfort those and encourage those people who have lost loved ones, a whole community devastated, this is not the only place, Father. You know that. I know that. But just specifically, I pray this upon them. I ask now through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that you help us to understand how it is well with our soul. I ask this now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, in starting, before we start, I would like to add a couple of verses to your uh, paper. And the first one is, you know, we talked about this on Sunday, and I would like to write it down again. Four, five, and six. Six and seven. Okay? And for those of you who weren't here, I would recite it, but I don't want to, uh, like Charlie says, mess up. So, but this is a prayer for us for this month, and this is something that I uh, we're, we were we were asked to do this, and just in light of uh, uh, everything that's been going on, I like this, and I don't. And if you don't mind, if you'll if you'll um, be patient and just listen, I'll read it to you. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And this is the day and this is the evening that we like to have an extra prayer. So this is the reason that I bring this up. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, um, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And again, there's a lot. We have, if you do, you have a promise. This is what I want you to do. When you do this, you have God's promise. That's, that's, we understand that well. The other thing I wanted to do was directly related to our lesson, which is, if you want to write it down, this on your paper it has to do with my opening statement, and it says this. Tonight I want to talk about three reasons why, regardless of the circumstances we face in life, and I have written down here the Texas shooting, seems like that would be known as a pretty big adversity, and what I have, and I would like to read it to you again also, is Matthew 10, 28 through 31, and for those of you who think that you're going to slow us down, the church with your foolishness in trying to kill us, forget it. 
Matthew 10, 28 through 31, and I'll read it. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered, and therefore do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. So, um, I like that. So we'll move on. Jesus was asked this question in Mark 8.36. Or Jesus asked the question, and here's what he says is, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So that's letting you know when you look at that close <clears throat> that everybody's soul is lost unless they have the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay, we can go into that, but that's why he's asking the question, because he's letting you know, do you know if your soul, do you know if you're saved or not, basically? That's all he's really trying to say. That's why he's asking the question. So the three points I want to talk about regarding our soul are, first, man's soul was created originally with God's glory. Adamic sin caused man to give up God's glory or man's soul. And then Jesus Christ restores the glory of God to whosoever believes the gospel through faith. In reference to Jesus' question in Mark 8, 36, who better to ask the question than the one who participated in both the creation of the world, the creation of man, and the creation of the soul, but the Lord Jesus Christ. He was there, so he would know. All right, <clears throat> looking at our text, let's take a look at that real quick, and I'll read that for you. And that is Genesis 1, 26 through 27. <clears throat> Something that I'd like to, um, excuse me. This is on the sixth day when God is, is, is creating, really beginning again, it, truthfully, is what he's doing here. He's created the heaven and the earth on, on, on Genesis 1-1, and then now we're down to day six where he's creating man. But he says this. <clears throat> if you look at verse 24, it starts on this day. He says, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. That word there is, is haya nefesh, where he calls them the living creatures, or they, they, they are living things, okay? And everything created from day Five and day six have haya nefesh, okay? And then that's what the idea is, being uh, created after its own kind. And that's what's known as the word men. And that's, all haya nefesh has men, except for the interesting thing is the next one, and that's why it's highlighted there. And if you have a key Bible, it might have a little key beside it, and that really is what, is what kind of lets you know God's got something else going on here. Um, then God said, <clears throat> let us make man in our image according to our likeness and then he goes on to say and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them so again, like I say, tonight I want to talk about three things that pertain to that, that the Lord brings out. Um, just on a side note, wouldn't that, be inter wouldn't that be exciting if everything was under our rule today, you know, like if you have pets or anything? 
Like I have a cat, you try to tell her to do something, and it's like, <laughs> not going to happen. So anyway, all right. <laughs> A study of our text is going to reveal how and why man's soul was created. Uh, in, in February of 2011, our pastor, Ron Adema, taught a lesson on what was known as the worth of the human soul. And the question was asked to him, and so he, he wrote it down, and this is what it was. What is the worth that God sees in fallen mankind that would cause him to send his only begotten son to die on the cross for them? And would cause him to send missionaries to foreign souls to die for them, meaning God and his son. What is the worth that God sees? Okay? And that's, why do I say that? Because we as humans, do you guys ever walk around looking at people? When we walk around and we look at people, do we really think about what is their soul? What, what's in their soul? Versus, like, we kind of look at you, we see you. You know, how would we know, in other words, either you have a well soul or you got a broken soul. And you didn't, the only difference is in what did I believe pertaining to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only difference. My soul's not broken if I believe Christ died for my sins, was buried and risen again. But my soul is broken because of Adamic sin, which we'll find out more We'll find out more about that. But the point is, is do you ever think about that? Or do you kind of like, are you looking, do you, do you walk around and recognize, you know, we're in a world full of broken souls out here. Broken down people, broken souls. They don't know it. We don't know it. Unless we may be engaged in conversation. So it's just something to think about. Yeah, I might ask them. I might talk to them about it, okay. I like to know. I'm a guy that needs to know, you know. I'm just one of those people. All right. <clears throat> so what is the worth that God sees? The answer is going to be found in this passage, what's known as uh, Salim de Muth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Salim de Muth. That's the Hebrew words that are used here to explain this passage. Our image according to our likeness. Okay, that's the Hebrew words there. We got it written down. I'll, we'll get to it. The thing that's interesting, I find, is that the word bara is a Hebrew word for create. Okay? To create. To create. Not to make something out of nothing. And there's a passage there, Romans 4, 17 through 21, and that you're real familiar with that. But that's where Abraham is told to, to um, that... Through him, the seed will come, and, and through his wife, Abraham and his wife. And then the passage goes on to say that uh, Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope, that God, who can make something out of nothing, would make this to come to pass. And that's what took place. <clears throat> in other words, they were dead beyond, they couldn't have children, and God made it happen. He, so... Uh, this word bara, as I referred to earlier, but it is used in Genesis 1-1, the creation of the heaven and the earth. Then in Genesis 1-21, for the sea creatures and the winged creatures. And then again in Genesis 1-27. This time in Genesis 1-27, it's used three times to demonstrate the uniqueness of the human soul. Um, so, let's take a look at that. Then God, and, uh, you know, we got some Greek students, or Hebrew students here, and, and that right there, when it says, then God, um, that's what's known as a circumstantial, a, not a circumstantial, but conjunctive wall. In other words, it's like, and then God said, okay? But it says Elohim, and so we've got plurality there, but the English doesn't really bring it out. People that come to this church know we're talking about plurality. We're talking about the Trinity being involved in this situation. But how many people do you hear talking about stuff and they talk about God and they talk about God and they talk about God and they're doing that because of they don't want to offend people to talk about the God who's, who has a son and his son's name is Jesus Christ. See, they don't, want to, they don't want to offend other people. 
So that, that we can use this generic term. And, uh, but we're talking about the God who is the Father, who is the Son, and who is the Holy Spirit. See, this is the God we're talking about here. And he says, let us make man in our image <clears throat> according, and there's our word, Salim, image, Salim, according to our likeness. And there's the word, Demuth. And then it drops on down. He says this, and God created, bara, that's a cal imperfect. Well, and that just, that means incomplete action, okay? Uh, and there's a reason for that. He creates him, but it's, he's incomplete, but he's, he's in man in his own image. He hadn't finished it yet. Now then, in the image of God, he, he picks it up again. He created bara. Now we have cal perfect, all right? The significance of that is that it's in a completed state. And not only that, it was, see, this was done in what's known as eternity past in the Eternal Life Conference. This soul, this, this Salim Demuth design and all was in eternity past. This is God's plan all along. That's why when I said to begin with, originally was created with God's glory. Okay, that's the idea behind that because... Well, I, I, wanna, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but in a sense, we as believers, that's been restored to us, whereas that's what I mean. Other people, it has not been restored. They're still in a fallen state. So um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a real big deal, in other words. This is a real big deal. It, it might not seem like it to you, but it's a real big deal. All right. Not only did they, this, he was created in the past, but also the male and the female. They're, they're very special. In, that's why it's brought out here. God created man. In the image of God, he created him. And then it even goes further. Male and female, he created them. Uh, again, there's another bara cal perfect. Um, what this does, what this passage does for us is simply this. It informs us that the human soul was designed in eternity past at the eternal life conference. Now, turn to John 17, 5 and 24 for a moment. I want to show you something here. Um, This is why I was trying to uh, saying to you, this is where, like my Bible calls it the high priestly prayer. This is where Jesus, after, this is still them, uh, he's still in the upper room and he's giving this upper room discourse, right? And he's talking to them and he's telling them things that he's letting them know what's coming down. Uh, but now then he's, <clears throat> he's turned his attention to the Father and he tells them, now Father, the hour has come, all right? Uh, but let's look at verse 5. And now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And I don't have it down here, but look over at verse 20. Uh, he's talking to the Father about the disciples that are there. But notice verse 20. He says, I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. That's us, okay? He's talking about us, and he's talking to the Father about us. Here he is approximately 2,000 years ago. And so he says this to him, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Finally, verse 24. Father, <clears throat> I desire that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where, where I am, in order that, and that would be what we call a, um, uh, it slipped my mind, but it's a declarative clause. Hina is a declarative clause. He, he's, he, why be in order that they may 
thou hast given me, be with me where I am, in order that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. Um, 524. Well, <clears throat> the point I think I'm trying to make there is that the glory that Christ had before the foundation of the world, he's wanting the Father to reveal it to those who are there, and that he's also letting us know that we participate in that glory too. That was my idea there. Um, so, back to our text. We can go um, back to Genesis 126, or your paper, either one you want to use. <laughs> I've got down here a note. <clears throat> Here's the significance of what I was trying to tell you about bara and, and other things. There's some words here that um, we want to point out. Genesis 126 says this, God made, and there's a word asa, he made man, all right? While 127 says that he created, okay? Why is that important? Okay? Asa to make something, like I build things, right? I build things. And when I build things, I use things to build things. And so what God's doing here is he's saying he's going to make man. All right? Asa, see, refers to the, the design or the pattern decreed at the Eternal Life Conference. So back then they designed man. That's why when I was pointing out to you, he, he developed all of these Haya Nefesh, all of these other creatures, and then, boom, he says, <clears throat> why is that important? Well, then he says, I'm going to make man. Why is man important? See, what is man important for? Well, t the topic tonight is the soul. But really, it is to resolve what's known as the angelic conflict. Man was created to show Satan that God is fair. Satan says, oh, you're not fair. That's not fair to kick me out. That's not fair. He says, I'll show you I am fair, and this is what I'm going to do. And so we, we kind of go on down. And so, of course, he, he creates our soul. He, he, he creates a, a soul within a structure. The other animals don't have the same type of soul. And that's the significance of Selim de Muth, is he's letting you know that this creature has something different than the other creatures. And, and, and if I get to it, I'll, uh, I'll outline it for you. Y'all just be patient now. I mean, some of you probably go, hey, dude, I already know all this stuff. It's just like, I'm doing what I'm told. I love it. All right. <clears throat> Bara, that's my point. Asa refers to, to the design or pattern decreed at the Eternal Life Conference. Bara means it refers to the actual decreed creation. And that's why... In the incomplete stage, he's saying here, and God created man. He's in, an, in his own image. He's in an com incomplete stage, but then he goes ahead and completes it, perfects it. it. It's like, here's the idea. This is what it's going to be. Because, you know, remember who we're talking about. We're talking about God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. These guys, they got it together. They know what's going on. They're not like us. But we can be like them. Bara refers to the actual decreed creation. The following three acts of Bara produced a unique human soul. First of all, here's the, the purpose behind it. When he says, God created man in his own image, and there's our word, Salim. What that is for is, if you'll notice, it is a compatible spiritual relationship with the Godhead. Okay? We know when Adam sinned, he died spiritually and began to die physically also, but he died spiritually. That compatible spiritual relationship, see, was cut off, stopped. <clears throat> In the image, the Salim of God, he created him. Again, this is so you could, human beings, in other words, they, man was created, Salim to Muth, so that, that he could have a relationship with the Father relationships with others and that's what this is and then that's why he points out male and female he created them so that we could have compatible 
marital relationships one with another, husband and wife. All right. Now I have down here also 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16, which really is that area <clears throat> that shows the divine chain of command. There's the Father, there's the Son, Jesus, then there's the husband who's the head of the wife, then the wife. You see the order. The point is, is to have a compatible marital relationship, you have to keep things in that order. If they don't stay in that order, you're going to notice things are not going to work right. There'll, there'll be, it's, it's not going to work right. I didn't make the rules. I'm just telling you that that's how it is. <laughs> okay? And, um, the, <clears throat> and don't go crazy in, with the idea of being the head of the woman. Um, the, the reminder is, in, is going to be found in Ephesians 5.22 through like probably down through 30, which is husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, as, as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. See, so that's the whole idea behind that. Being the head, in other words, I have to demonstrate love to my wife as Christ demonstrates, as God has demonstrated his love towards us through Christ. That's how I'm the head. I'm not the head by bossing her around. It won't work. Well, in my case, it would probably work because <laughs> my wife is very sweet and wouldn't hurt a fly. But that's what got me straightened out was because it didn't, it didn't, I yell at her and she'd do it. And I was like, hmm, that's not right. All right. Um, here we go. The Salim Demuth of the human soul is patterned, it was patterned after the Trinity of God. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm talking too fast. It's patterned after the Trinity or Godhead. And then uh, what I have here is one in essence. And then I want to show you, I know y'all know the essence box, right? But that's what we're after is we have, you know, omniscient. Boy, if I have to write all that out, it's going to be tough. Omnipresent. What if I just do it? Because y'all know this. Um, the O's. You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> you got the, we call it Cell Junior Uve from the camp, but you've got omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. Uh, we have love. Then we're going to have um, veracity. Yeah. The three O's. Then we have a sovereignty. Okay. Um, and I've got it here to remind myself. <laughs> yeah. Righteousness. Did somebody say that? Righteousness. Um, eternal life. We got that one. And then, like you say, immutability which is um, God doesn't lie. Veracity means he never changes. And then holiness is another one that I've got here. Different people might have different ones, but the point I'm trying to get at is by creating him, Salim to Moose, creating him in his image and all, he's really after this. This is your father. This is the father. This is the son. And then this is the Holy Spirit. They all three, see, they are different in persons, but all have the same essence. And that's what he's after with this soul idea, creating man. He, he, you know, he created him. See, originally man's soul was created originally with God's glory. So when he's created, you know, we struggle with that probably understanding that uh, today. But when, in looking back at it, when he created Adam, that's what he's saying is Adam was still... Adam was like, well, he's perfect. See, he's perfect. He does, he's not, doesn't have any, doesn't, there's no wrong with there. He, so he's got God's glory. Now then, you know, we know the, the rest of the story uh, more or less. But here's the point as I'm trying to get at is, he's created, the, the Salim Demuth of the human soul was patterned, see, 
This human soul that we're fixing to look at over here was patterned after this, the essence of God. Now then, the human soul <clears throat> is invisible and immaterial to the human eye, yet the image or the essence of the human soul can be experienced within oneself and by others. Now then, originally, here we have the soul, okay? This is what he's meaning by that. Uh, we have this, self-conscious, right? That means we have an awareness of, of um, God. We have an awareness of ourselves, because God, and then others. Uh, like my wife says, I'm not too sure you are aware of others. And I say, well, okay. <laughs> then we have conscience, right? And this is really to discern between right and wrong. Now, some passages for this would be for... The, the one up here would be Romans uh, 1, 28, then Acts 17, 27, for conscience. Uh, I have down here Genesis 2, 17, okay? For our conscience, th there's a passage there. That, you know, that one is where he tells them don't eat of this tree because it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's given you the idea between good and evil, to discern between good and evil. Again, who sets it up? God has set up this plan. Mentality. Here's a good one. Uh, all of this, this whole thing here can be a series and a lesson in itself. But what I'm after is, is for you to get the idea just briefly. Our left lobe, it was created for our mind and for perception so we can understand stuff. All right, and you'd find that I'm gonna put left lobe, mind, and a passage for that would be Second Corinthians uh, three three, and then also four six. Uh, then there, then we have the right lobe, which the right lobe. This is like again, this is mentality. Uh, it's important because you really realize that. Um, you know, we're talking about our mind, and we get on down to, well, we do have emotions and we do have volition. Emotions is another one, but the right lobe would be uh, Revelations 2.23 is one for that one. Just And uh, also, this is the soul. This is the soul in the concept of the essence of the soul. It was created in a perfect sense. That's why it's kind of goofy for them to go, well, if I eat of this tree, I'm going to learn more than, you know, I'm going to learn more when God's the one teaching them to begin with. How are they going to learn more? Like, how am I going to know more? How am I going to learn more than God knows, so to speak? When God's, who knows, who knows everything, <laughs> how am I going to learn more than that? And, and so, you know, as you can see, but volition is free will. Uh, then John 3.18 is one there. And then finally I have emotion. And, and a lot of our churches today really rely heavily on emotion, and I think that's why I was trying to bring this out mentality is God's more interested in, 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 he doesn't, the Holy Spirit's not going to, he's not going to make my emotions, I can't learn God's, my emotions are feelings, they're not mind, so I can't learn God's word through my emotions, I can feel like I, when I'd be down at the jail, I'd be talking to some guys and they would go, I feel you, man. I feel you, brother. I feel you. And I was like, I don't know what. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So I gathered, maybe we must have been getting some kind of an emotional deal, but I'm just saying. Uh, but emotions help you to appreciate your feelings. Okay? Now then, these still are in a effect today even if you're broken this hasn't changed this is what separates us from the animals okay this is still the same 
but now then it's broken or through faith in the gospel, it has been restored. And then, and then Matthew 27, 3 through 5, that's where Peter feels remorse. Okay, in other words, like that's just an example of, of an emotion. He felt remorse for what he had done. But I have that as Matthew 27, 3 through 5. All right. All that being said, I just to 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 to, to help explain these two passages. The human soul pattern after the Trinity. Okay? And then uh this is the essence that God's saying when he's saying in our image. And then this is what it's like when he's saying uh, according to our likeness. So, Selim refers to the image of the Son of God. Okay? And some passages for that would be your Genesis 9, 6, uh, Colossians 1, 15, and then here, Matthew 22, 20. Turn to that passage for a moment if you would please uh, Matthew uh, 22 chapter 22 verse 20 And this is where they ask Jesus, he says to them, they're saying, show, they say, Jesus perceived their mouth. They're, verse 17, tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he answers and says to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God, the things that are God's. And hearing this, they marveled, and leaving him, they went away. Um, I bring that up because of the idea being is this. Um, Our image according to our likeness. First of all, our is like a first plural possessive pronoun, phenomenal suffix. Did you get that done? <laughs> all right. Why is that important? Because he's trying to help us to understand something. This passage can help you understand the fact that the meaning of image is according to likeness. Image according to likeness is the stress here. It's not... There are some Bibles that will say in our image and according to our likeness. And that's not what the text points out. The text is image according to likeness. And really it's the idea of this. Um, it's a, a way of saying it is this. It's two sides to one coin, not two coins. Not two different things happening here, but two sides to one coin. For example... This coin that Jesus is talking about, he says, it says there was a resemblance of likeness of Tiberius Caesar on one side. One side was the portrait of, Imper of the emperor Tiberius. On the other side is the inscription in Latin, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. So the coin was issued by Caesar and was used for paying tax to him. In relation to what we're talking about here, who made the coin? Who made this coin? See? God made this coin fashioned after this coin. And, and of course, this is in the original state. And now we know because of Adam's sin, it can also be a broken state. So it's a dented coin. All right. <clears throat> so that's not on your paper. So I, but the point I'm trying to make is, is that Jesus is bringing that out clearly, that what is Caesar's is his, but what is God's is his. And his question is, who are you? Whose side are you on? Uh, so, Demuth, Salim refers to the image of the Son of God. Now then, Demuth, it refers to the likeness of the Godhead, being one in essence, but different in persons. 
Now, I have there, I don't know if your paper's underlined or not, but I have underlined 1 Corinthians 11, 7. And that's where Paul uses this verse, and he quotes and he says, uh, man's head is, is not to be covered, because, you know, he's talking to, um, they're, they're referring to women and having long hair and so forth and so on. But that, he says a man's head when they're in, the, when they're in church and it, that, is a, that was a custom thing, but what he's after is, is the main part of it is <clears throat> man's head is not to be covered. Why? Since he is the image and glory of God. So he's letting us know we are created in the image and glory of God. He, he's going all the way back to the original, this Genesis 1, 26, 27 idea. Um, point number two. At Adamic sin caused man to give up his glory. Because of Adam's original sin, and we have AOS, the human soul <clears throat> made in the image according to the likeness of Godhead fell short of the glory of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And that's your Genesis 9-6 passage. Uh, that, is the, that particular passage there is where Noah has been given the permission, like he can eat all kinds of different things, he can eat meat and everything, but he says, if man's blood is shed at his hand, that guy should be, his blood should be shed also. Why? Because do not kill one another, basically, because man is made in the image of God. And that's what that passage is. Mark 8, 37 says this, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Adam, the head of the human race, he gave up his soul or God's glory through sin. So now every member of the human race falls short of the glory of God. Adamic, Adam's original sin. Romans 3, 23, 24 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Colossians 1.15, Christ, and he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So Adam's sin caused us this perfect soul to be broken or to fall, to be lost. Christ has come or was sent all as a part of God's plan, really what we would call his perfect plan, is to restore that. <clears throat> so, point number three I have down. Um, Jesus Christ restores the glory of God to, who's over, to whosoever soul believes the gospel of grace salvation through faith. <clears throat> so now we have God has created him. He's created this soul man in a perfect state. Man's been given this thing and he's basically just cast it aside. And now God is not satisfied with that, with that concept or with that idea. So in eternity past, he's created, you know, he's established a way for it to be resolved. This is where Satan, <clears throat> involved, he got involved ahead of time. So God said, I'm going to create man so that you will see that I'm fair. So what does he do is he goes to the earth so that he can try to, to mess up God's plan again so that God will say, well, since Adam's fallen, you have to, and if you're going to let him ride, you have to let me ride. And he says, no, that's not going to happen. He, I'm going to give him freedom of choice, and he'll choose, he'll choose me over, he'll, he'll choose me of his own free will. Now, Satan was allowed, and, and he had plenty of opportunity to change his mind about God's plan by being cast out, 
but he refused, so that's why he's, he was cast out. That was the reason hell was created, was for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for us. But, depending upon what you believe, pertaining to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you, you could end up in hell if you don't put your faith in Christ in his finished work. You will end up in hell because that's what God's word says. On in Revelations, it, you'll find that, you know, we know that. Here we go, though. Uh, Jesus Christ restores the glory of God to whoever believes the gospel of grace salvation through faith. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. These are some passages, and here's, I've got the other two. I want to just go ahead and read them. Uh, right here, it tells us that uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. This is to show you that Christ has restored us. It, 15, 22, 1 Corinthians. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Um, it says that Christ restores us, the believer who believes the gospel. Now then, I've got some passages on here. I, I do have them written here. The 13 charges of Adam's original sin are removed by faith in the gospel of grace salvation. We know these passages, but just a refresher, 15, 3, and 4 says this. Uh, Paul says, First of all, I give unto you that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that after three days he rose again, according to the Scriptures. We know, we could say, well, what Scriptures, well, what scriptures are you talking about, Paul? And, and they are, of course, the Old Testament. Uh, why am I saying this? Because once I believe the gospel, the 13 charges have been removed. What are the 13 charges? Um, we know they're removed. We know what they are. <laughs> spiritual death, the wrath of God, spiritual blindness, spiritual alienation, enmity, condemnation, unrighteousness. Uh, we're in spiritual darkness. We're under the curse of the law. We're in the slave market of sin. We're a natural man. We're perishing. We're ungodly. All of those were given to us when we were born into this world with this lost soul. Okay? When I believe the gospel, now I have a saved soul. All of those are removed. Plus, um, 13, well, do the math. There's 50 other things, but one of them you can lose, which would be the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. But there's quite a few things there. Uh, here's my point. Once these are removed, then the image of God's Son is restored by the regeneration work of the Holy Spirit. This is why I say, uh, I think I, in my mind, I might have been a little concerned about this. Man's soul was created originally with God's glory. It took me to do this lesson to really to be okay with saying these things. Adamic sin caused man to give up God's glory. Now then, Jesus Christ restores the glory of God to whosoever believes the gospel through faith. I was struggling with that until I began to do the study, and the study points out that, yeah, everything that I said is actually, is, 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 is actually true and correct. You know, but I struggled with that word glory and stuff like that. That's just me personal. Uh, and how does this take place? Well, he saved us. Titus 3, 5, 6. God saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The moment we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us, restores us back, to where we were originally. How do we know? It says, he, 
Hebrews 1.3 says, And he, Christ, is the radiance of his glory, God's glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, this is who we believe in, Jesus Christ made purification of sins. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. His work was completed. The plan of God is going to be carried out to fullness. Now then, why are we saved? We are saved to become conformed to the image of God's Son, for whom he foreknew. This is in Romans 8, 29. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we are saved to be conformed to the image that we once had. It was done in eternity past, fell, and now then we are being saved to be conformed back to the image of Christ. You know, you know we understand that we have to either, if the rapture doesn't come, we have, you know, we have to put off this old, this, this flesh has to die and become that new creation. Well, we are the new creation. We just have to put on uh, the resurrected body, fashioned after his body. Now, uh, a couple of more passages here, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, here I've got 1 Peter 2.25. You were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. That's why I keep reiterating. We have returned because Christ has made a way for us. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord. That's why I was telling you all of these passages are showing us that Christ has restored the glory of God to us. So therefore... To God, the worth of the human soul, as originally created, is his reason for sending his son to die on a cross, to be buried, and to rise from the dead, so that he could restore his Salim de Muth by the work of Christ to us through faith. And just as a side note, I've wrote down at the end of this, um, even, even if we don't feel like it at times, uh, I hope that this lesson has encourages us to not only say, but to know that it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Okay? I don't, you know, I'm not a good singer. I'd sing it for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I do like to hear that song, actually. It is very, uh, it is well with my soul, for a fact. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's go, we'll go ahead and close up in a word of prayer, and then we'll um, finish up with our, our regular prayer requests. Father, once again, I do want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to share your word. I know that it was real important to me, Lord. Uh, Salim DeMuth, uh, what a fantastic concept. What a fantastic idea. What a fantastic place for us to be as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, to know that we have been restored back to being able to have a personal relationship with you. Thank you for that, Father. I pray for all of those this evening as uh, we go forward. I pray for safety in their travel. I pray for their marriages. I pray for them, just their souls in general that you continue to encourage them, lift them up, and bring them to a place where that Spirit of God, when they walk out in the world, just shines brightly to where they are able to reflect the love and grace that you've given to us. Thank you once again, Father. I love you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.